uh, if we don't see that uh, very massive amount of mass uh, of gas around it, then um, you know, the, there might be something else propelling it. You know, a, a spacecraft obviously can, in principle, have an engine that uh, will not produce such a massive cloud of gas. The only thing anyone ever wants to hear about a city-sized comet is that it won't come anywhere near Earth. And yes, near is a slippery word in space. The object in question is headed our way, but headed our way in orbital mechanics means a safe observational pass. 3i Atlas, an interstellar visitor on course to pass about 167 million miles from Earth on December 19. That's not a threat window, that's a viewing window. So why is this one such a big deal? Because it's not just another frosty snowball drifting through sunlight. The numbers say it's doing something we don't expect. The images hint at behavior we don't fully understand. And the timing gives us a rare, crisp opportunity to test how far our comet physics really goes. If you care about evidence first and hype never, this is where you lean in. Let's begin with what's hard, cold, and measured. 3i Atlas reached perihelion, the closest point to the Sun, on October 29 at roughly 1.36 AU. That's solar oven territory for comet chemistry. Sunlight intense enough to warm the surface, drive volatiles out of the crust, and build the kind of gas jets that act like tiny rocket nozzles. In normal comets, that's when you see the show. The coma swells, a tail forms away from the sun, the brightness ramps along a familiar curve, and the orbit you compute from gravity alone more or less works after you account for small pushes from jets that cancel out statistically as the nucleus tumbles. But here's the catch. When teams fit the track of 3i Atlas across multiple nights of astrometry, subtracted the sun's gravity, subtracted radiation pressure on a compact nucleus, and included the usual perturbations. They were left with a residual acceleration that didn't vanish. A small, steady, in-plane push remained radial away from the sun and transverse along the path. Tiny in magnitude, yes. Pedestrian to the naked eye, absolutely. But steady, coherent, and real in the fit. In other words, there is a whisper-level thrust living in the data that gravity alone doesn't explain. Before we chase explanations, we have to translate the scale. Space makes small forces matter because they integrate over time. Think of a grocery cart rolling across a parking lot. A single tap on the handle does nothing. A gentle, consistent push nudges it meters down the lane. In orbital mechanics, a micro-push compounded over days can drift an object tens of thousands of kilometers from the path you compute with gravity alone. That's what the non-gravitational term means here. Not magic, not mystery for its own sake. Just the recognition that a persistent directional effect is acting on a body that should, by default, follow the sun's pull and nothing else. The moment you confirm that, you have to ask what's pushing. The cleanest natural answer is outgassing. Heat sunlight into a surface patch that's rich in volatile ices, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and closer in, water, and gas vents out at a few hundred meters per second. Momentum conservation says if mass leaves in one direction, the nucleus recoils the other way. Do that unevenly across latitudes and longitudes, and through rotation you'll often average to a messy, wobbling net. Do it with surprising coherence in one hemisphere or from a persistent vent that keeps lining up with the sun and the velocity vector, and you can maintain a low but measurable in-plane push for days. That explanation is not only plausible, it's the default in comet physics. But here, where the puzzle sharpens rather than softens, if jets are doing the work required by the measured acceleration, then the implied mass loss is large enough that you expect a photometric signature to match more dust, a larger coma, a brighter halo, something your instruments can confirm. You don't need a Hollywood tale. You need receipts. Some frames have hinted at activity and even rare visual geometry like an anti-tail. When the line of sight crosses the orbital plane and a flat dust sheet projects sunward, but the giant, obvious coma you'd expect from losing double-digit percents of mass in a month hasn't dominated the scene. That mismatch, force budget versus visible exhaust, doesn't break physics. It just tells you to keep testing. The ejected material might be gas-rich and dust-poor. The viewing geometry might be unkind. Or the usual assumptions about grain size and scattering might be off for an object built under a different star's chemistry. Color deepens the story. 
Earlier in the approach, observers reported a reddish cast in line with organic-coated grains and then a greenish tint linked to emissions like diatomic carbon. Near perihelion, the object's measured spectrum leaned bluer than expected. A quick myth bust. Blue does not mean hotter than the sun. If the nucleus were a glowing lump of blue-hot metal, we'd be living in an entirely different conversation. Blue in comet contexts typically points to emission lines, Co plus in the UV blue, for example, or scattering by very fine particles that favor shorter wavelengths. That's not unprecedented, but it is unusual. And when you stack it next to a steep brightness slope, faster than the classic inverse square falloff and steeper than the active comet benchmark, you start to collect anomalies that call for more than a shrug. You also start to see why reasonable people with strong statistical instincts want the rawest possible data released quickly. Calibrated spectra across bands that isolate water, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide, consistent photometry across filters, and astrometry good enough to turn raw positions into residuals without fitting biases. Mass and size matter here too. 3i Atlas is not Amuamua, that skinny wild card that skimmed through and lit debate on fire with its odd shape and enigmatic push. This one is much more massive. Think multi-kilometer scale nucleus, the kind of object that tends to carry inertia like a freight train and shrugs off tiny forces. If you're measuring a non-gravitational acceleration on something that big, you can't get it for free. The momentum exchange has to come from somewhere. Either you're throwing mass overboard, gas jets, or you're coupling to the environment in a way we don't usually model for compact bodies. Light sails with extreme area-to-mass ratios, magnetic coupling that would require substantial ionization and coherent fields, radiation pressure amplified by structures we haven't seen. The first bucket is ordinary comet physics with unusual parameters. The second bucket is the kind of exotic scenario you label speculative, and then try to falsify with the next observation. There are timing curiosities. The incoming trajectory sits very close to the ecliptic, the plane where planets orbit. And while low inclination interstellar entry is not impossible, the odds are slim compared with the full sky of options beyond our system. That by itself proves nothing. Rare events have to happen to someone. And here we are. But when you're already carrying dynamic anomalies and spectral surprises, low inclination arrival becomes one more eyebrow raiser on the list. There have also been claims about nickel-heavy composition relative to iron, an unusual ratio in natural, ice-rich comets, which, if confirmed, would hint at processed material. But claims travel faster than peer review. The right move is to park that as interesting if true and keep watching the literature for a vetted result. You've probably seen the Sunward Jet screenshots by now. In July and August, some processed images showed a feature that looked like a plume pointing toward the sun, which breaks the simple cartoon of tail always away from the sun. This is a good moment to talk projection. Dust sheets and trails, especially big particles released long before perihelion, can form a flat, gently curving structure in the orbital plane. When Earth crosses that plane and the sheet lines up edge-on, the projected feature can look like a spike toward the sun, an anti-tail. It's uncommon, it's counterintuitive, and it has fooled people before. The way you keep your footing is to model the geometry day by day and see if a sunward feature appears when and only when the line of sight hits that configuration. If it does, you chalk it up to projection. If it doesn't, you investigate a genuine sunward jet and ask what physics would do that. It's never mystery because we like mystery. It's mystery until a specific test knocks it down. Now put the dynamics, the light, the color, and the geometry together and ask the question that keeps social media spinning. Should we be calling this a spacecraft? The honest answer is that spacecraft is a conclusion, not a starting point. The right starting point is a short list of hypotheses that make measurable predictions. If jets drive the push, spectra will show the volatiles doing the work, and the magnitude of the non-gravitational term should track the activity. Fatting with distance and correlating with rotational phase as active longitudes swing into sunlight. If radiation pressure on a thin structure drives the push, the area-to-mass ratio inferred from the acceleration will be enormous. The photometry will behave more like a flat reflector than a dusty coma, and rotation will leave a distinct modulation. If magnetic coupling or plasma drag is in play, 
will see variability keyed to the solar wind environment rather than a steady in plane shove. And if none of those natural couplings match the persistence, direction, and magnitude of the measured force, and we continue to lack the mass loss receipts a jet model needs, then and only then do we lean into. This isn't normal in the strong sense. That's why this December window matters. A pass at tilde 167 million miles is close enough to pull quality spectra from the ground on good nights, and it's a perfect excuse to get the big guns aligned. Space telescopes for clean lines free from atmospheric absorption, and any opportunistic assets in deep space that happen to have the object in their fields. The Mars window mattered because cameras like Hi-Rise can resolve detail no Earth-based telescope can touch when geometry cooperates. A single, well-timed image could show whether the coma is compact or broad, whether activity is patchy or symmetric, and whether jets align in ways that explain a coherent in-plane push. If that image exists and hasn't been released because a funding freeze or an internal queue slowed it down, say so and put a date on the release. If it doesn't exist because the exposure failed or the target was too faint at the time, say that plainly. Transparency is not only a public trust issue, it's how you accelerate the science. The fastest way to kill rumor and sharpen models is to let hundreds of eyes and dozens of independent pipelines hammer on the same photons. Let's also talk about why non-gravitational acceleration confirmed sounds scarier than it is. Gravity is still the boss. The sun's pull at 1-2 AU dominates motion by orders of magnitude. The residual we're talking about is tiny compared with that pull. Think a millionth of Earth's gravity, but persistent, so it accumulates. That's why you'll hear tens of thousands of kilometers of drift over weeks. That's a lot to a human brain and nothing to the orbit of a body crossing hundreds of millions of kilometers. It's the difference between you're off by a state and you're off by a planet. Even when you include the non-gravitational term, the trajectory isn't bending toward Earth. It's adjusting a hyperbolic exit into interstellar space. The safe distance on December 19 isn't a guess. It's baked into the solution. You prepare telescopes, not bunkers. Another subtle point, noise versus coherence. Solar wind gusts and magnetic reconnection events in the heliosphere do push on charged particles and can buffet dust, but their signatures are noisy, spiky, variable, and often off the orbital plane because fields and flows don't line up cleanly with the geometry of a comet's path. The reported push on 3I Atlas isn't a wind gust. It's a gentle hand that keeps pointing within errors where the orbital plane lives. That's one reason radiation pressure, solar wind, and magnetic coupling don't sit comfortably as complete explanations for the measured term. They may be part of the background. They don't look like the driver. What about the arrival angle, the mass, and the timing with respect to other planets? It's true that the trajectory's near-ecliptic approach made for interesting alignments with Mars, Venus, and down the road, Jupiter's neighborhood. It's tempting to see precision or suspicious choreography in that sequence. Orbital mechanics teaches you humility there. With enough interstellar objects over enough time, some will pass conveniently for us, some will pass invisibly, some will thread alignments that make for great press conferences and most will just be geometry. The meaningful question isn't does it look poetic, it's does the motion require a force we can't account for? If yes, you quantify it and trace it back to a mechanism. If no, you resist the poetry and keep counting photons. There's also the human question. Should we be prepping? For danger, no. For science, absolutely. That means observers keep feeding astrometry to the public databases so the fits get cleaner. Spectroscopists keep chasing lines that tell us which volatiles dominate and in what amounts. Image processors keep posting their methodologies so color claims don't drift on the back of aggressive filtering. And anyone who caught a deep, sharp frame at the right moment shares it with caveats rather than teasers. It also means we keep our language precise. Confirmed in the fit is not the same thing as we know the cause and we keep a hard line between question worth asking and answer already proven. The fastest way to burn trust is to pretend we've closed the case. The fastest way to waste a once-in-a-generation object is to shrug at anomalies because they're inconvenient. If you've watched coverage drift toward powered or controlled, here's the sanity check you can hold in your head. A powered craft would show one or more of the following. 
Thrust profiles not tied to solar heating, coarse changes decoupled from rotation and sunlight, spectral signatures inconsistent with natural volatiles, or structural hints in high-resolution imagery that don't look like fractured regolith and ice. We don't have that package. We have a persistent, plane-confined push, a brightness curve that climbed fast near perihelion, a color story that ran bluer than the lazy expectation, and a handful of geometric oddities that projection math can tame. That's not spacecraft. That, keep measuring. So where does that leave us for the next six weeks? With homework and a gift. The homework is simple. Treat this object like the best lab class you've ever had. If the non-gravitational term is a jet-driven momentum story, mass loss numbers, spectra, and coma structure should line up. If bluer than the sun is just Co plus screaming under UV, line strength should confirm it, and the blue will fade with distance in a way we can model. If the brightness slope was steep because water sat out while Co and Co2 carried the load, we should see water pick up later than expected in the lines. If the anti-tail was projection, its timeline should match the Earth plane crossing. All of those are falsifiable. Gift is attention. Interstellar visitors are rare. Interstellar visitors that give us weeks of observation with this much community focus are rarer still. Most of the time, small bodies sneak in and sneak out before the world notices. 3i Atlas has everyone's eyes for the right reason. The data refuses to be boring. That's how science gets better. One stubborn residual, one awkward color, one poorly behaved light curve at a time. When your models are right, reality rewards you with precision. When your models are incomplete, reality humbles you with surprises. Both outcomes make you wiser. Between now and December 19, that wisdom will arrive one plot, one spectrum, one pointed discussion at a time. We'll call out what's confirmed, label what's plausible and keep a wall between what's measured and what's imagined. If the force budget finds its missing coma, we'll say so. If it doesn't and the push stays weird, we'll say that louder. Either way, the safe answer to should we be prepping stays the same. Prepare your curiosity, not your pantry. Prepare your questions, not your bunker. And prepare to see one tiny fragment from another star system teach us, again, how much we still have to learn. If you value this kind of breakdown, measure first. Myth bust where needed and keep the story moving as the data comes in. Drop a like so more people see it. Tell me in the comments what prediction you think will be confirmed next, and hit subscribe so you don't miss the new spectra, the updated orbital fit, and any high-raise frames that finally give us a look at what 3i Atlas is really doing out there.